Yes, and you'll notice that I don't use that title in my slide. It just wouldn't fit, frankly, and I really didn't know what it meant. So as many speakers are saying, the cute titles are nice, but this, this particular lecture now copies just about everything that has either been said or is going to be said today. So you will see me rushing through a couple of slides very quickly because it's already something that's been covered. But I do want to talk on this whole concept of biofilms, bioburns, and differentiating infected from non-infected wounds, and maybe take a little bit more of a pragmatic standpoint and, and just give my opinion. I've been lecturing on this topic for a very long time, and a lot of my opinions have been very controversial, even though I back them with the best evidence I can, but because it flies in the face of what's being said in the wound world. If you go to any of the big wound healing meetings, there's a lot of discussion on biofilm-based wound therapies and the importance of bioburdens and reducing these and the proper diagnosis of it. And I really didn't believe and still don't believe that there's enough information to support all of that. Well, it's been very nice that my feelings on this have now been validated. I mean, it makes me feel a little bit good that the European Wound Management Association came out with their guidance on antimicrobials and non-healing wounds. Now, just about 10 minutes before this session started, I met Dr. Romanelli and realized that he is, in fact, the author of these guidelines, and this is what he was going to talk about today. So, Dr. Romanelli, thank you very much for validating what I've been saying for years, but on the other hand, I'm going to steal some of your thunder. So, I do apologize for that in advance. But basically, the stated purpose of this document was to describe controversies surrounding the use of antimicrobials in wound management, and also to say that we need to be better prepared for selecting the right product for the right patient for the right wound at the right time. And what I'm going to do throughout the rest of this talk is I'm going to give you what I've been thinking, what I've been saying, and my evidence to back it up, and then what the, EWMC, the EWMA has also been saying about it. The diagnosis of infection, this has been talked about a lot in the past. We still say in our 2012 IDSA guidelines that it is a clinical diagnosis. You're looking for the primary signs of inflammation. We also do pay lip service in the 2012 guidelines, something we did not do in the 2004 guideline, to the fact that there may be so-called secondary signs of inflammation or secondary signs of infection, and they would include delayed wound healing, changes in granulation tissue if you have pale or salmon-colored granulation, which is friable and uh, edematous. These all may be signs of some sort of infection in the wound, above and beyond the classic signs of inflammation. And then we'll talk a little bit about the microbiologic diagnosis, and Dr. Horowitz's lecture was brilliant, and, and I just wonder where this is going to fit in with our clinical management. The wound infection continuum has been talked about in the wound world for years, and basically it breaks down to bacterial contamination, colonization, critical colonization, and then infection. And you all know these definitions. They're up on the slide. I don't need to necessarily go into each one. But I do want to spend a little time on this concept of critical colonization. Because critical colonization has always been really that pivotal phase. This is the one that the wound healing people will point to and say, this is what we need to address. This is what we really need to look at. And this is uh, courtesy of Ben. Basically, this is just a cartoon showing this whole concept of contamination, colonization, critical colonization, and infection. Now, what's the magic number? If I were to say to you, what is the determining number or burden that you need to have to, de to determine whether a wound is infected or just colonized, what's that number you usually hear? About 10 to the fifth, right? Well, what does that 10 to the fifth mean? Let me ask you this question, and this is a question I ask whenever I lecture at a wound meeting. Talk about quantitative bacteriology and trying to find this 10 to the fifth. Here we have some of the top wound experts in the world. How many of you do quantitative bacteriology at your hospitals? That's what I thought. So it's not particularly a practical approach to determining infection. And this is the EWMA statement. We believe that the definition of infection for acute wound greater than or equal to 10 to the fifth bacteria per cubic centimeter may not be appropriate for non-healing wounds. So again, something that's been talked about for years, but we don't have any good evidence to support. Well, critical colonization, again, is that pivotal phase where the bacteria is replicating and possibly causing damage, but the host isn't responding. But well, when you have a critically colonized wound, one of three things can happen. It can either deteriorate to a clinical infection, it can remain in that critically colonized state, or it can improve following appropriate intervention. 
So this sounds good. It's very theoretical. It sounds good. It makes a lot of sense ever since this was first written up. But there's really no proof. How do we really define this? So what the EWMA says, is at present a consensus on how to define and identify critical colonization has not been reached, and the term is confusing and needs a stricter definition before it can be used clinically. See, these are all, these are all uh, held out as end all and be all when you go to and you listen to wound healing specialists and you go to these wound meetings. And I'm just begging and saying that what we need is just better evidence to support all of this. And it's, it's doable. People said for years you couldn't do good osteomyelitis studies. Look at the work Ben quoted to you today. There's some beautiful work just in the last year or two being done on diabetic foot osteomyelitis. Microbiology, is a wound ever sterile? No, the only way to sterilize a wound is to actually heal it. Organisms change to, uh, tend to change over time. Certainly Dr. Horowitz pointed to that as the organism changes, uh, as the wound changes, different organisms will predominate. And the presence of bacteria in and of itself doesn't seem to inhibit wound healing. And this to me is probably the major point of my talk because you hear people say all the time, you need to treat these subclinical infections because these subclinical infections are causing uh, chronic inflammation which pumps out MMPs and causes wounds to fail to heal. Yet if we look at the studies that have been done, and I've listed them here, they have found that and a lot of them were done under the vacuum-assisted closure, showed that the bacterial load played no appreciable role in wound closure, and that wounds under occlusion healed despite increased number of bacteria. So maybe what's important, again, more than this, is not that there are bacteria present, but what are those bacteria? And Dr. Horowitz started talking about this concept of groups. Uh, some papers refer to it as pathogen-related groups. I think uh, David Armstrong's been saying for years, paraphrasing uh, one of our ex-first ladies, that it takes a community. And maybe that's what it does. It takes a community to determine exactly what organism is causing an infection. So more important is which organisms are here. Let me add a paper that is so new, I didn't even have time to put it on one of these slides. A uh, recent paper out by Chris Adinger and John Steinberg at the Georgetown Group looked at the vacuum-assisted closure, the KCI vac, with the instill, where they instill during the vac cycle an antimicrobial. Well, what did they find? They found that by using an antimicrobial installation, they decreased rates of hospitalization. That was statistically significant. They decreased rates of wound, uh, they decreased time to wound healing. But what they did not do is change the culture results. So by instilling a topical antimicrobial into a wound, it did not affect the culture results, yet the wounds healed more actively. It's something more than just the fact that bacteria are on the wound. So the EWMA said the causal relationship between the presence of microorganisms in a wound and the progress of the wound healing is not entirely understood. And we believe not all microbial organisms must be eliminated from the wound. Well, what's a biofilm? Again, we hear a lot about biofilm-based wound therapies. This is a strict definition of it, one of the earlier definitions from 1999. A structured community of bacterial cells enclosed in a self-produced polymeric matrix and adherent to an inert or living surface. We used to call this the polyglycolic slime layer uh, before we had all these fancy terms. That Some bacteria produce these slimes and they cover themselves with them. What are the role of biofilms? Well, these species produce a glycocalyx that inhibits antibiotic penetration. This allows the organisms within the biofilm to become quiescent. They're not in their usual planktonic state. Because of that, they become more resistant to antibiotics. The antibiotics not only cannot penetrate the biofilm, unless you use some sort of dispersant to get them in there, but once the antibiotic is within the organism in the biofilm, the organism is not doing its usual um, metabolism, so it does not have any effect. And it may prevent this whole idea of Randy Walcott's that it may prevent wounds from healing by causing chronic low-grade infection. And the role of quorum sensing is just fascinating to me. This concept that the bacteria within a biofilm can communicate. They send chemical signals between colonies and between organisms to say it's time to become quiescent, it's time to become pathologic.
Ben already showed you this slide. I'm not going to talk about cultures. I think that was well covered. Quantitative bacteriology is not the gold standard, I don't think. But the work that's being done now on these molecular techniques, I agree. I am firmly in the camp of Dr. Lipsky and Dr. Hurwitz. I really think that molecular techniques, whether it be the old PCR techniques, mass spec, or the 16S uh, ribosomal sequencing, is going to be the diagnostic technique of the future. But my question is, to quote the old uh, Saturday Night Live, is it ready for prime time? You know, it's not, I don't know if it's ready for prime time. And what information that we get from this is clinically relevant? If any of you have seen one of these reports that come out from these commercially uh, available testing labs that do 16S ribosomal sequencing, you will find a list of 15, 20, 25 organisms and with all relative amounts of that organism, how many copies of the genetic material. So we know the abundance. But what does any of this mean to us? Do we need to worry about addressing all 16, 20, 25 organisms? Or is it possible that just the organisms that are cultured, that we have found for the last 50 years, 60 years, on routine culture, maybe they're the only ones we do need to culture, that we do need to treat? We don't know. And that's, I think, the answer that yet is the missing piece. And you saw that nice jigsaw puzzle. I think that's one of the big missing pieces. Because as we sit here today, when you as a clinician get a culture result back, you see Staph aureus, group B strep, SSS, RR, SRS. You know what that means. Now instead you're going to get a culture report, a, a sequencing report back with 20 organisms, and it's going to say, well, it's got a MECA gene, and maybe along with the MECA gene, it's got a staphylococcal chromosomal cassette MEC4 gene. What does this mean to you? Well, it means it's a community associated USA 300 MRSA that may be susceptible to tetracyclines, trimethoprim sulfa, vancomycin. Now, if it also has an inducible macrolidolincosable streptogramin gene, maybe it's no longer susceptible to clindamycin. So we need to make this technology, which is brilliant technology, but we need to make it clinically accessible. And I don't think we're there yet, and, and that needs some work. This is just an interesting uh, piece that was done in Microbe. Microbe is one of the magazines put out by the American Society of Microbiology called PCR's Changing Clinical Diagnosis. And you can see the bottom line here. These diagnostic technologies are adept when dealing with orthopedic, chronic wound, and hospital-acquired infections. Interesting paper that came out in 2012 just looked at cultures versus 16XS ribosomal sequencing. And what they found was they did parallel samples from 51 cultured wounds or chronic wounds under molecular testing, there were 145 unique genera found, and under traditional aerobic cultures, only 14. And they found that the organism with the higher relative abundance on the genetic testing were the ones that were more likely to be detected by culture, which only makes sense. But again, the question, what does this mean clinically? There are some people that are looking at this whole question, uh, especially Dowd and Walcott. They did this study. I have some issues with it. This was in the Journal of Wound Care where they took three groups of patients. It's a large study. Took three groups of patients with non-healing wounds. They gave one antibiotics directed by traditional culture. They gave one antibiotics directed by molecular testing. And they gave one not only antibiotics directed by molecular testing, but a special antimicrobial gel that was formulated based on that antimicrobial testing. And what they found is you can see the numbers increased as you went from the empiric therapy we're using now through molecular testing, through molecular testing and what they're calling personalized medicine. Well, what's the problem with this study? I have two basic problems. They did disclose very clearly that both of these primary authors are principals in a company that does both sequencing and making gels. They also did not do a vehicle control or any sort of other control. It's possible that this gel may have contained tetracycline. All they say about the gel in the study is that the gel was a proprietary formulation and they would not reveal what it contained. Well, maybe it contained a tetracycline. We know that tetracyclines have inherent wound healing activity above and beyond their antimicrobial activity. So we don't know whether or not this personalized gel or this sequenced form gel really had any effect on the wound healing. And I think that it's an interesting study. It needs to be followed up. Do we need to remove biofilms? 
How do you do it? There are lots of techniques, chemical, mechanical. Just walk out in the exhibit hall, there are a number of techniques you can see. And then there's some work being done on signaling an eruption. So what does the EWMA say? Biofilm may be present, but their influence on wound healing is uncertain. And the presence of biofilm in a wound does not always lead to treatment failure and or delayed healing. Antimicrobial use in wounds, we'll just finish up with this. In our 2012 guidelines, which of course you all know Dr. Ben Lipsky was the chair of our committee and the lead author, what we said is that the routine use of systemic antibiotics in clinically non-infected wounds is not supported by the evidence. Well, what about topical antimicrobials? Everybody seems to have a topical antimicrobial product out there. I don't think there are three questions that have been properly addressed, and these are ones we have to ask. Number one, can we assume that topical antimicrobials decrease bio burden? Something as simple as that has not been addressed. And actually, that would be a very interesting use for the sequencing, because that would be extremely sensitive. It would be nice to look at. Will reduction in bio burden heal a wound more quickly? Well, I don't think we have the evidence that it does yet. And will reduction of bio burden prevent a non-infected wound from becoming infected? Larry Lavery showed that 50% of all clinically non-infected wounds, diabetic foot wounds, will become infected and require systemic antibiotics. Can we reduce that number? What does EWMA say? Removal of microorganisms is not a sufficient endpoint for efficacy of a topical antimicrobial. And it's not a very good surrogate parameter to, to demonstrate the clinical significant effect of an antimicrobial product. At present, the evidence to show the controlling wound bio burn improves healing outcomes is limited. Topical antimicrobials, we have antibiotics, we have antiseptics. I'm not going to go into antiseptics in the limited time I have left. I do want to concentrate on the topical antibiotics, though, because there's some interesting work being done here. You see pexaganin, we're going to talk about that. Genomycin collagen sponge, a product that a company called Inacol is developing for adjunctive therapy for IDSA moderate to severe infections. But let me just finish up talking about pexaganin. Now, full disclosure, uh, I am a consultant to Dipexium, the company that does make pexaganin. This is an interesting drug. It's a peptide antibiotic derived from the skin of the Amazon clawed frog. Now, this is what separates genius from the rest of us, how this was discovered. Uh, Mike Zaslav, who's an MD, PhD, was working at the NIH doing oophorectomies on these Amazon frogs. And he would roughly suture them back together and throw them in this disgusting swampy water. Now, again, separating what, you know, this is like the light bulb going off. He said, hold on a second. These frogs are not getting infected. So there must be something in the skin of the frog that's keeping them from getting infected. So he ground up a lot of frogs. I'm not sure about that. But anyway, he was able to find this peptide antibiotic, and he called it meganin. Meganin's Hebrew for shield. They then synthesized it to a product called pexaganin. And they ran a pivotal trial back in the 19, late 1990s that Ben was the lead author on, where they took 835 patients with a mild, what we now call a mild diabetic foot infection, and ran topical pexaganin versus oral ofloxacin. Yes, it was not a good comparator, but it's what the FDA wanted. And what they did is they found equivalence in clinical improvement, microbiological eradication, and wound healing. There was no significant difference. And to me, especially in my interest in ID, most important is that on the ofloxacin group, resistance developed. On the pexaganin group, no resistance developed. So the FDA looked at this back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and came up with the opinion that you need to do a vehicle-controlled study. Well, those of us who were consultants, it was a different company back then, said, you can't do this. A lot of us were involved. Ben was involved. I think David might have. No, this was before David's time, I think. We said, you can't do this. It's not ethical. Mrs. Jones, you have an infected diabetic foot. We're either going to give you a placebo, or we're going to give you an active antibiotic or a placebo and watch your foot rot off. Any of you see that one-page article in the New England Journal that just came out in December? This guy sat at home and took pictures of his foot for 10 straight days as the foot went from a little erythema to a full-fledged necrotizing fasciitis. That's how quickly these can develop. So it was an unethical proposition. Well, Pexaganin, the Dipexium folks have now developed a protocol that's about to begin phase three trial under a special protocol assessment from the FDA starting in the next two months, where they are looking at, for the first ever, vehicle control trial for the management of diabetic foot infection.
And the only reason they were able to do this was because of intensive data safety monitoring and following the patient daily for the first couple of days, even in an outpatient setting. So they actually are just, just a mess. They are looking for centers to do this study, and they do have a booth out there. So anyway, in conclusion, I just want to bring a little pragmatism to some of the science that we have. There's a lot of talk about bio burn, a lot of talk about biofilms, a lot of talk about the molecular testing. But I really think we need a lot more evidence, a lot more questions answered before we can draw any firm conclusions. Thank you very much.